Okay, uh, thank you, Dom. Um, yeah, my name is Jonas. Uh, I'm from Switzerland originally, but I have lived in Japan for five and a half years. I work for a company called HDE. Uh, we are a SaaS company. If any of you is looking for a job or for an internship, uh, come talk to me after this talk. Um, I would be happy to offer you one. Um, so yeah, my talk uh, title is uh, Artisanal Async Adventures, and the artisanal part of this asynchronous adventure will be handcrafted in front of your very eyes live right now. So the goal of the talk is to show you what asynchronous networking is, or I will always call it async for short, um, how it works and why it works. And hopefully to help you understand that it's not as complicated or scary as you think. And as I said, I'm going to do this live in front of you. So uh, to do this, I will, have, I will need a problem that needs solving that I can show you how to solve. The problem I have come up with is that I've figured out a new algorithm that will change the world. And I know that billions and billions of people will want to use this algorithm every day of every, every second of every day of their life uh, to just have a better life. So I'm now going to show you this algorithm that I will show the world. Uh, by the way, everything is going to be Python 3.6. I'm going to use Python type hints because they help me and I hope they help you. So. Um, Let's import some types, and then let's implement an algorithm. Algorithm takes a number and returns a number. And what it does is it takes a number and it adds 42. This is, I mean, you can all understand that this is amazing and that everybody will use this. So because everybody wants to use it, the logical thing to do is to put it on the internet. And I could use Flask, I could use Django, anything like that to build a nice REST API or something like that. But HTTP is very high level and it has a huge overhead. And so we're not going to do this. Instead, we're just going to use the socket module in this Python standard library and build a, so uh, a server like that. So we're going to import socket and write our little server. The server will run on an address. And an address is just a uh, tuple of a string, which is the interface to bind to, and an integer, which is the port to bind to. And because it's a server, it will run forever, so it will have no return value. And so let's, let's implement the server. The server is a socket, and it's going to be address family internet, so that's IP, and it will be a stream socket. Uh, so this is a TCP IP so socket, they, if you, basically the most normal socket you can think of. Uh, we will also tell it um, to reuse its address. Uh, I don't 100% understand why this is necessary, but all the cool people do it, so I'll do it too. And then we will bind the address that we pass in. This will turn our socket into a server socket. And then we will listen on this address for incoming connections. Uh, don't worry too much about the five, that's just how many connections we will have um, at most waiting for uh, before we can accept it. And as normal for a server, we will do a, inf uh, let's move that to the top a bit, we'll do an infinite loop uh, in which we will accept um, connections. And the way you accept connections from a client in a socket server is you call the accept function uh, method on the socket object. The accept func method uh, returns a tuple of a client socket and an address from which the client connected. So we'll do a little bit of logging. We got a connection from address. And because we want to keep our code clean instead of do dealing with the connection directly in the server, we will just call a handler function with the client. Now we have to create a handler function. The handler function takes a client which is a socket, and it also returns nothing, because, again, everybody will want to use my amazing new algorithm, so we want to make this high performance, so we will let clients reuse their connection. So again, we will have an infinite loop, and we will read the request from the socket, which you do via, via receive, and receive takes a number of bytes, which is the maximum number of bytes you want to read. And if the request is empty, if the request is empty, uh, we will close the connection 
and stop. If it's not empty, we will simply assume that it is a number. And even though the request is a bytes object, a nifty thing with Python is you can actually pass it in bytes, and as long as it's ASCII numbers, it will return the correct integer. And then we will get the result by calling our algorithm with the number passed in, and then send it back to the client. You do that via send. Send takes a um, bytes object, uh, but we want to have a new one at the end, so it's just easier for the client to deal with. And now, if we actually call our server with a tuple, and we'll just use localhost and 303030, assuming I need no typo, this should actually work. No syntax error, that's a good start. So to test our little app, I will do something called netcat and see for short. Netcat is a very simple way to talk to sockets either locally or over the internet. And you give it a, um, an address and a port. And then you can basically type stuff in and that will be sent to the server. So could somebody from the front row, could you put me a number between 1 and 100? 35? 25, good. Anyone? Uh, hang on. Why is it, does this work? OK, 25, yeah, so this is, um, we can do 2, 44. Really, it works. And now let's say we have a second person who wants to use this amazing API. And can somebody else uh, give me a number? Nine? Nine and two? Um, okay. Um, this is a bit embarrassing. Um, it doesn't work anymore. Like here? Yeah, it still works. It's perfect. And we only see one connection from the client. So something is wrong. Something is terribly, terribly wrong. And we we'll see what is wrong. The problem is that um, by default, Python, like many other languages, by default, they are blocking. And we'll just run in a single thread from top to bottom and not care about anything else. And we have a little problem, and that is that we have two while loops. We have one while loop in the handler and one in the server. So the server will block forever for connections, and the client will block forever uh, for data from the client and to send that data. And while one client is connected here at the bottom, uh, the server cannot accept new connections. So we have a big, big problem here that we need to solve. And we could use threads, we could use multiple processes, um, but as you might have gathered from the title of this talk, uh, we're going to use asynchronous networking. And so Python 3 recently added some really cool things, and one cool thing is the async keyword. So we're going to make this server asynchronous by calling, by changing our functions to be async. We tell them to be async, and they of course, um, let's close those connections, yeah. And now if we run the server again, uh, it stops immediately and gives us a warning. Uh, again, this is embarrassing. I thought this would just work, um, but it doesn't. And the problem is that async def, the async keyword does not make a function async. The async keyword makes a function possible to be async. And to understand what this means, we will do a little bit of a Python 101. Uh, so I have an IPython shell here, so if I have a function foo, that prints bar, and if I call the function foo, it prints bar. That's what we expect. Now if I have an async function bar that prints foo, and then I call this function bar, it doesn't print foo, but it returns this, co this weird coroutine object. So what is a coroutine object? A nifty feature of um, IPython is if you write the name of a variable, then a dot, and then hit tab a couple of times, you get this little menu at the bottom here that shows you what is available on that object. Now, because I have read the documentation on uh, coroutine objects for you, I know that if I call the send function with none, this will happen. The interesting thing is it actually printed foo at the top. Before this scary error stuff, it printed foo. And then it wants to stop iteration. And again, because I read the documentation for you, I know that this is what we expect. A coroutine object will not run when called. It will be a coroutine object that if you call send on it, and 
pass none to it, it will run to the next point where it can stop. If it's finished with all its work, it will raise a stop iteration func uh, error. So our server here, when we call it, it will return a coroutine object. It will not actually run any of the code inside. And we will call these coroutine objects or these things that we want to do, we will, I will call them tasks. So we will change our code at the bottom to say add task. So because server returns a task, we say we want to add a task. And in the server, when we call handler, which we also made async, we also say add task. And then, so we have a way to add tasks to something, to our system, and then we need a function run. So these are the two cornerstones that we're going to use. We, we're going to have add task, and the task function takes a task and returns nothing. And we'll just define the task to be a type variable because the, yeah, there's no good typing for this variable. And then run takes nothing, returns nothing. Now, what do we do in the add tasks? We will need a global risk of tasks. And we will use a deck, not a list. Um, a deck is, for those who are not familiar, it's from the collections module in the standard library, a deck or double-ended queue is very good at appending on either side and popping from either side. And since we don't want to actually index into this thing ever, um, using a deck is better than a list here, but you can use a list, it doesn't matter. And in a task, we simply append tasks. Now, before we write our run function, we have to go back to our server and our handler. Because the whole thing about async is that it's asynchronous I.O. So we have, we have to look in this code at where our I.O. happens. And it's happening in three places. Number one, at, if we go logically, is the accept function. When we call socket block accept, this will block forever until a connection comes. We don't want that. We want this to be asynchronous. So we have to use a wait. But the socket module is not asynchronous, so we have to do that ourselves. So we will say, we will define an async accept function, which takes a socket, and then eventually returns um, a client and an address. The two other places where we need this is when we call receive. We will implement an async receive eventually. We're passing the socket and the number of bytes we want to read. And sending may, may also be blocking, depending on your system. So we will also say async send. And we give it a client and the number of bytes. So let's implement these three. Async accept takes a socket and returns a tuple of a socket and an address. So we need to do something before we can call accept and return. Same thing, oh, this should be async def, I'm sorry. We have to do for receive, where we will get a socket and a number of bytes that we want to read, and it will return bytes. But we have to do something here before we can call receive on the socket. And the same thing for send. Uh, it gets data and it will return integer, although we don't care about that. So, I wrote two D three times, and the thing is, we will run our tasks in the run function, and we have found a way to suspend execution of code and run it again by calling send. The problem is these three functions actually want to tell the code that runs our tasks, so our run function, that it is waiting for something, that it will not, that it doesn't, cannot continue its work until a certain condition is met. Um, so let's go back to our um, IPython shell, and now comes a little bit of magic, and this is probably the, the weirdest thing about this whole talk. If we define a class foo, uh, which implements a done await method, which yields values. 
So this is this is weird looking. But then if we have an async function bar, uh, which awaits an instance of that object, and then we get the coroutine object of that async function, and we call send on it, we get 42 out. We get the thing from under await out. So we, have, we now have a way to signal from within asynchronous functions to the system that runs the asynchronous function that we want some, that we, can, we have a way to signal information. And the information that we're going to signal is what we are waiting to, to happen. So we are awaiting, wait until we can read on the socket. Same thing for, for receive. We are waiting until we can read on the socket. And for send, we say await until we can send action send on the socket. Now, we, we haven't implemented can or action yet, so let's do that. The can action uh, class takes a action and a target. It stores them on itself, and then in its dunder await method, it simply yields those two things. And the action will just make an enum, which has a read and a send. Uh, import it from enum, that's still all standard library. So we have these functions. Now, the thing we have left is the run function. In the run function, we once again have a while true loop, uh, a while loop, but this time we say while there is a task to run, get a task, run that task to its next await point. If we get a stop iteration, the task is done, so we'll simply continue. Uh, now, if the action is read, do something. If the action is send, do something. Otherwise, raise an exception, because something terribly wrong has happened. And now, what do we do when we want to read? Well, it's waiting to be able to read, so we will put it into a waiting area. So we will implement waiting areas. We will say there is a wait read area, which is a dictionary of sockets tasks. And we'll say there's a send waiting area, which is a, dic a dictionary from sockets to tasks. Simple enough. So if we, if the task tells us it wants to read, we will simply put it in the waiting area for reading, and if it's in this, if it wants to send, we will put it in the waiting area for sending. So we now have a way to move these tasks out of the queue and into these waiting areas. So we need to modify our loop here to say while there's any tasks that can be done, that can be run, or there's anything waiting, keep running. And so we move these tasks out of the task queue into the waiting areas. So we have to have a way to, so in this, on this line, in the, in, the, in the while loop, we might not have any tasks. So while we don't have tasks, we need a way to move these tasks back out of the waiting area into the task queue. And how do we do that? We use the select call. Select is a system call from the select module, again, standard library, and the select API is you give it a list of sockets that you want to read on, so our wait read area. You give it a list of sockets that you want to send to, and you give it a third list that I don't really, that doesn't really matter here. And it will return a triple of a list of sockets that can be read right now, a list of sockets that can be sent to right now, and a third thing again that doesn't matter here. So for all these sockets in the list of sockets that we can read, we will move them out of the waiting area for reading and back into the task queue. 
for all the sockets in the that can be sent to, we will again move them out of the send area into the task queue. And now, again, assuming I did not make a typo or a mistake, uh, I did make a mistake, assuming I made no further typos or mistake, this should actually work. Somebody wanted a 25, somebody wanted a 9. Yeah, we have, I have two, two shells here. They're both connected. I can have a third one. If anybody wants a number, shout it. No? One? Works? Perfect. So, this code works, but how does it work? So, let's talk very quickly through how this works. At the bottom of the code, I call add task with the server. So, we will move the server code routine into the task queue. Then we call run. Run, run. So while any tasks, yes, we have a task, so we will run. While not tasks, no, we have a task, skip. Current task is our server task. We call send on it, which will execute our server code all the way to the await. And await is accept tells us that the action is we want to read and the target is the server socket. So we will move it out of the task queue into the wait reading area and we will say the current talk and go back to the while loop. So by any task, we have no task, but we have stuff in the reading area. So we will go into the inner while loop and we'll call select. If there's a connection, the select call will return the server socket in the can read um, variable. If there's no connection, there's nothing, and we will just keep running in this, this while not task loop until there is a connection, at which point we will move it out of the reading area a waiting area for reading and back into the task queue. Which means that we then go again to the outer while loop and we have a task, so we skip the first part and the current task is again the server coroutine. Back to the server. Server will run, it will do the print thing and it will add task handler client, go back to the while through loop and await async accept again, which means the target is once again, the target here is once again, our server socket, and the action is again read. So we move the server coroutine back into the waiting area. But now we added the handler to the tasks. So now when we go back to the top of the while loop, we still have a task, which is the handler, which will now become the current task. And we will run the handler until first await call, which is async receive. The target is now the handler's client socket, and the action is still read which means it also goes into the wait read waiting area. So they are both in the waiting area and the task is, is empty. We will hit the inner while loop again and we wait until either there's a new connection or the client has sent us some data. And whichever happens first, or if both happen roughly at the same time, we will move, it move that task back out of the waiting area, back into the task queue, and we keep doing that forever and ever and ever and ever until we're bored. And that's more or less how it works. And the benefit of this system over, let's say, multiple processes or threads is that the memory overhead and the CPU overhead is quite low. Because you don't need a lot of memory to store all these tasks. It's just a deck or a dict. And the task will only be in one of those places at a time. And you don't have a lot of overhead because the select call is actually just that the kernel handles that. So it's probably quite good. And that's more or less, this is my talk, and I know this has been very quick, very a lot, and I'm going to be even more evil right now because this talk actually comes with homework. Because what I would like you to do is to go home and try to do what I just did by yourself. You don't have to do it in 30 minutes. You can do it over a much longer time. You're allowed to look at documentation. You're allowed to look at, at my talk. Like, that's not a problem. But try to write down yourself. This was not even a hundred lines of Python. It's not a lot to write. Try to do it yourself and try to understand better by doing it yourself how and why it works. Because that's how I did it. I wrote this and I was like, ah, oh, I now better understand how this works. If you want a little bit of extra homework, try to not use the select call. Instead, if you're on um, OSX, use the KQ call, which is also in the select module. If you're on Linux, 
try to use ePoll, also in the select module. If you're on Windows, try to use DevPoll, also in the select module. And try to understand then how, how those are different and why those are better. And that pretty much is it. Um, I will be here uh, for the rest of the conference, so if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me while I'm in the hallway. And again, if you're looking for a job or an internship, also come talk to me. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas.